Our program tonight is by our expert who's kept my saw running. And this is this is Dr. Bob. That's our scroll saw doctor. Yeah, I got I got hung up on the microphone there. Okay, um, last time I did this was oh, several years ago. Uh, where some of you saw me you know, get up here and take one of these things apart. Uh, couldn't get it back together in the same class, so we wound up making making a feature length, which turned out to be four parts over at Rob's shop. And that thing has gotten a bunch of views on, on YouTube. I'm going to springboard off of that and show you instead uh, some of what I've learned since then. Uh, some of the tips and tricks and uh, some of the lessons learned as I have... Uh, serviced a bunch of scroll saws. What I'm going to show you first is a little bit about uh, what one of these things does. Most of you see the outside of one of these saws. You see this this little arm here going up and down and you think, my, that's wonderful. Yeah. There is, uh, looks like Willy, Willy Wonka's chocolate factory going on on the inside when you turn one of these things on. There's a whole lot of parts moving around inside there. What's, what starts the action is back here, there's an electric motor that has an eccentric shaft. And then it's got a connecting rod on the end of that that comes up here to what, what is known as a vertical rocker. The vertical rocker then transfers that back and forth motion that you see here to a bigger back and forth motion transferred by these two linkages, the one that you can see here, and an identical one that's going on inside this upper arm. That causes these two rockers in the front to move up and down, which is the whole principle behind one of these scroll saws, is it takes a little five-inch blade and moves it up and down at a variable speed. Usually pretty fast, and in Hans's case, it's never fast enough. Okay, then up in the front here, there's a couple of blade clamps with a thumb screw on here to tighten the, tighten the blade. There's a uh, tensioner here that what it does is it transfers a motion inside here to a pull rod that's down inside here that pulls this wedge against this tensioning plate here which adds tension to, to the blade and gives it that that little ping sound okay since I went through that pretty fast and we'll take an example of that motor and pass it around here. Uh, one of the things that I didn't tell you about on this motor is this eccentric shaft that you can see real well when you're holding it in your hand. That is what makes this motor unique. I have not found a replacement motor other than that made by DeWalt at the rate of $265 a copy. So you don't want to mess one of these things up. And one of the one of the quick ways to mess one of these things up is if you forget that that screw on there is left hand thread. So when you when you're trying to get this thing apart, you got to remember when you get to that nut, turn it the other way. <laughs> okay. Any questions so far? Hey, Bob. Is yes. Isn't there some kind of bellows or something in there? Oh yeah. Uh, we can we okay, can see that a little bit better when we get over there. But there's a rubber bellows underneath here. Matter of fact, you could see an example of it because it's this, what they do is they use an awful lot of the same parts in the upper, upper and lower half of this machine. But you can see this odd-looking little mushroom. Mm -hmm. That goes on the inside of this bellows, and that thing going up and down is what draws air in and exhausts air out of this tube here to blow sawdust off of your object that you're trying to cut. Okay, um, one of the things that uh, that I didn't cover last time that I, that I caught on the Internet is I was looking for other people that might be doing... Uh, you know, classes like this, you can uh, notice it easier on this saw. There's this lug here that is the tail end of this table on this saw, this saw right here. So the table 
plugs into that stud that is on the end of there. The front end of the table is held in place by a yoke that is held in place with this big uh, knob on the front. Okay, I mentioned the vertical rocker that's right there. I've got that, that whole assembly uh, right here in, in this example, but I'll do a pass around. I would recommend that you not open the bag because this thing has been greased and it is guaranteed that you'll have some of it on, on this nice shirt that you're wearing. And you will probably catch all kinds of abuse when you get home. Anyway, this is a fully assembled uh, vertical rocker. I'll pass another one around the other direction here since I brought two of them. We'll take a moment here to talk about the vertical rocker arm that goes in the back of the machine. Uh, this is the entire assembly. We can see a large scale version of what a sleeve and roller bearing looks like. This is the sleeve that the vertical rocker pivots on and the two bearings on the vertical rocker, there's one pressed in from this side, another pressed in from the other side. The uh, sleeve goes in there like that and would go into two casting receivers in the case. The connecting rod that I told you about is this, uh, this piece here. Here's one that's out of the machine and its sleeve looks like that. And usually what I do when I take a machine apart to examine it, I clean that uh, that sleeve off. This is one of the most critical ones in the entire machine. Clean that thing off and examine it just real carefully to see if there's any marks on it that would mate up with the size of the uh, roller bearings that are inside inside the small end of this connecting rod. This sleeve is the only sleeve in the DeWalt machine that you can't buy separately. What I have found after a considerable amount of discussion with DeWalt is that the only way that you can get this sleeve is as an assembly, this being the entire assembly. But since this part is so, so critical to the quiet operation of the machine, I don't argue with them. I, I usually go ahead and once I see that there's any any marks at all on that uh, on that sleeve, I go ahead and replace the whole part because it's not that much money. Installation of this thing, because of the fact that when the when the vertical rocker installs in the machine, it installs in an orientation like that, where the big end of the connecting rod is back toward the motor and the rocker is in, in front of the motor. So you need to keep your wits about you when you're installing this connecting rod into this vertical rocker so that when you got the vertical rocker out and in your hand and you got the connecting rod separate, you got to start thinking, let's see, does it go in here or does it go in here? The, uh, the right answer is that it goes in from this side. When you go putting, putting this together, generally what I will do is I, I'll, I will take a file and chamfer the inside of this edge, which will permit this sleeve to go in there without doing a great deal of damage to the, uh, to the casting of the vertical rocker. And then what you have to do is either tap that in with a rubber hammer or use a, an arbor press like what I, what I showed earlier and 
press this thing into place, use some type of a punch or lineup tool to go through there and, and coax this bushing into the uh, into the hole and then run your run your hardware through there and then make sure and secure uh, secure this thing well which by well what I mean is you put your you put your bolt through like this one is done there are uh, knurled washers on each side to keep the hardware from turning uh, then usually what I like to do is double nut uh, the threaded side of that and I also just for good measure I put uh, blue Loctite on there and lock that whole thing down the objective is that when you tighten this down what you're doing is you're, you're pinching this large part of this casting you're pinching that together to get good purchase on the end of that sleeve that will ensure that the small end of this connecting rod that in particular that sleeve is not slipping back and forth in that opening it will attempt to do so if you don't have it tight enough. If that thing is allowed to slip back and forth in there you will eventually eat a rut out of the inside of this casting and you'll be replacing this part which as I recall it was it was between thirty five and forty dollars. You know, high, price, high price to pay for loose hardware. Uh, so that's an example there of some of the most critical parts of the machine. Okay, we did the uh, we did the pointers over there. What I'll do next is I'll show you the saw that I brought with me. That is a it's a good example of a bad example. This one here is kind of typical of what I get in my shop when somebody calls me up and got, you know, got issues. Okay, usually what I hear when when uh, somebody brings the shop saw to me or, or I talk to them over the phone is, is this thing is making a lot of noise. And usually by a lot of noise, you start cranking it up. starts making noise like that. And what it is supposed to sound like is more like that. Uh, most of that vibration is caused by this soft top on the table. I, uh, I put this one on a hard surface so that uh, we'd have a better surface to work on. Okay, now then on to the part about some of what I have learned about these machines is usually while well, you know a customer has brought the saw to me usually one of the first things I do is I'll do some diagnosis while they're while they're on the spot so I'll give them an idea as to what uh, what they're looking at usually one of the first things that I try to do is figure out if the problem is in the rear because the, the source of the noise in these things is kind of deceptive you know, you turn the thing on, it starts making noise, and the noise sounds like it's coming from everywhere. Even with one of those uh, stethoscopes, it's still, because all this stuff is, is so tight, so linked together, it, it just carries throughout the whole machine. One of the things that I have noticed in, uh, in working with these things is that the quickest way I can find out if the problem's in the front or the rear makes a difference as to whether you break the case halves apart is you take and wiggle this lower rocker assembly and I don't know if Buzz has zoomed in tight enough on that thing yet make sure you get both of these Buzz off the bottom okay you'll notice when I'm when I'm moving the bottom one the top one is not moving that's not good 
that definitely tells me the problem is in the back end. I can then verify that by moving the the upper arm it will move a uh, uh, what I'm doing is I'm holding this one to see how much free play is in this one and there is just way too much free play in here now what that is indicative of those will show the camera over this way and zoom in and here and here what that's indicative of is some of this hardware that's in here either this bearing and, and the hardware attaching it or this bearing down here the hardware attaching that or more likely this uh, bolt going through here that is securing the bearing of this connecting rod to this vertical rocker I've, uh, I've learned a fair amount about this thing and all the bad things that it can do to you ever since I worked on Chris Woodall's machine. I had to, uh, I had to work on his about, probably had, had eight or part at least twice because that, that nut would work loose. And it was then that I found out that about the other surefire way to secure, get that nut tight and keep it tight is to use Loctite on it. And by Loctite, I mean you use the blue stuff because you can still disassemble that one. If you use the red stuff, to get that thing loose requires a torch. <laughs> Another thing before I go too far off here, the little bit about the history of the uh, DeWalt saws, they have been around for probably 25 years, I guess it is. They've gone through about oh, three or four different ownerships. Uh, I think most recently uh, they're owned by Black & Decker, I believe. Uh, prior to that was Stanley Tool, and prior to that was uh, Delta DeWalt Porter Cable. At any rate, in the, the uh, short history of these saws, they started out making them originally in Jackson, Tennessee. They did the kind of the proof of concept there for volume manufacturing. They sent that to Canada. They manufactured them there for quite a number of years. And then they transferred it to uh, China. They had some pretty, pretty bad bumps along the way when they transferred it to China. <laughs> Start up there was not, not real smooth. The, the uh, when they were made in Canada, they were called Type 1s. When they were made in China, they, uh, they changed it over to Type 2s. When most of you guys look at one of these things, you can't tell the difference between them. And I have noticed that the primary difference between the two, the big difference is this label. <laughs> the, the homologation label that's on top of the motor. Uh, one of them will say type one, you know, made in Canada. The other will say type two, made in, made in Taiwan. Uh, the other big difference that I have noticed is the type ones actually use grease on the bearings. The type twos did not. They used whatever grease the bearing manufacturer uh, supplied, which was usually just enough grease to keep the needles in the bearings. And because of their, their idea was that, you know, why should we add any more grease than that? And the Waltz idea was we're in the business of making saws. Why should we add grease? So they, uh, they didn't add any grease and they found that it would, the saw would stay together at least until the warranty ended. So they're good. <laughs> they're happy with that. So those are the two big differences that most people can, can notice about the saws. Uh, the so only other on that note then, so if you have a type two and you suspect it may not have grease, do we need to add it? Yes. Before we be, before we have a problem? Uh, it would be a good idea to put some grease on that thing before the warranty ends. I mean, granted you're gonna to have to take the machine apart, you know, which is what I'm gonna do here shortly. Uh, but these these needle bearings that are in these assemblies that are being passed around to you, uh, there's you know, 
little small needle bearings that have about oh, 12 or 15 um, rollers inside of there. And those are open frame needle bearings. Nothing that nothing to keep the grease in there. And the the manufacturer uses just enough oil and, and that kind of stuff to rely on the coefficient of friction to keep uh, keep that that bearing or keep those needles in place until the, the machine can be assembled. What grease do you recommend using? Uh, what I have found uh, the type of grease that, that I prefer is this Valvoline Synthetic. Um, I've had a fair amount of experience with with lubricants and so forth in a in a prior career, uh, where I was having to deal with uh, lubricating chain moving at high speed. And one of the things about you know high speed items that run under heat is uh, oil will want to sling off. It also migrates away from the source of the heat, which is just completely the opposite behavior that you want in a, in a bearing that's in this saw. Grease, you know, like wheel bearing grease, and particularly with the synthetic greases, the, uh, the, the lubrication properties of the grease actually will migrate toward the source of heat. And it will not be slung off. Uh, how often should you re-grease it? I have, um, since I started using that, that Valvoline lube or, or a good high quality you know, wheel bearing lube, maybe once every, oh, 10 years. <laughs> the ones that I have uh, lubricated with, with the, uh, uh, the Valvoline lube, the synthetic lube, I've not had a callback on any of those for, for any type of bearing failure. How do you apply? Um, I apply that when I've still got the bearing loose and apart. I'll put it on by, by dipping a Q-tip into the end of the, the grease and then swab it thoroughly on the inside of that, that uh, <coughs> needle bearing. Yep. Enough, enough transfers in there that... Where did you say you get this from? Uh, Napa is where I get it from, yeah. We've identified that this thing here is making noise. Uh, the next thing I'll show you is what uh, what has to transpire to start getting the machine apart. Can we back up one step? Yes, sir. Before you go to the back. Yep. On the very front, you were doing the pieces that go up and down like this. Yep. The pieces that actually hold the blade where it attaches. Mm -hmm. How? How much? How many wiggle well, should that have? Should it have any? How it will. It will be? more than likely have some because there is no way that you can tighten the screw enough to take all that play out. What will wind up happening, though, on an awful lot of these uh, bearings. Almost all of these needle bearings have a sleeve that goes through them, and the bolt, the purpose of that bolt is to capture uh, this casting and smash that casting firmly against that sleeve. So there's two needle bearings there and two at the top? Yep. There's two needle bearings here. Mm -hmm. There's two up there. So you go through here, there's one set of needle bearing, or one needle bearing inside here, another one inside there, another one here. And then for Buzz's benefit, there's there's one on each side of this piece of the rocker with a common sleeve that goes in between the two. And then one more needle bearing down in here. Then the same identical thing in the upper part. <coughs> then you've got several more uh, needle bearings in the here in the rear. There's one here, one here, and then this big one here. Are any of those common? Um, all these small ones, like this one, these two here, and most of the ones in the front are common. The different ones in the front 
are on the ends of this uh, linkage. Okay, so we'll buy it into here. I haven't tried disassembling one of these things while standing on my head before, so it'll be a little bit of an experience. I heartily recommend you keep some kind of a container to put the screws in. Is this a saw that came to you for repair? No, this is one that I actually uh, hid in my shop. Matter of fact, this one is a new saw that I came up with a uh, simulation of an accumulation of problems that I've encountered. So I kind of cheated a little bit for tonight <laughs> to uh, duplicate some of the problems that I typically encounter. Yeah, all of these are torques, yeah. Torques was what I couldn't remember. <laughs> what I usually do when I disassemble, when I work on one of these things in my shop, is I've usually got a hard surface, you know, an extra table like this that I can move it, pivot it. And then I'll usually put something soft on top of there so that when I drop a drop a nut or a yeah. screw, <laughs> If, you, if all you've got is the hard surface there, I'm guaranteed it's going to wind up in the least accessible place in the shop. Okay, now then at this point, this side is going to be able to come off. And then is where you will start to notice things getting real squirrely. Because now what happens is this foot here, this this whole thing starts to wobble back and forth. And uh, it makes it kind of hard to work on when it does that. So that's why usually the very first thing I do is I will take and put one of these, one of these nuts back on and tighten it down so <coughs> So that it makes it more rigid. So now you got, you know, it's a little tighter, but we still don't have a connector here yet. We can't connect that up until we get the side cover off because the side cover is, is this part here. Do the problems that you find on the DeWalt do they relate to other saw types? The Excalibur is almost identical. As a matter of fact, there, there is so much <coughs> similarity between the Excalibur and this saw, I have actually interchanged uh, things like the vertical rocker and the, uh, and the horizontal rockers in the front. The, what is different about them is this linkage. Uh, there's another saw, uh, very much like the two of those. I can't remember the name right off. The newest one is the same too. Yeah, the newest one is, is very close. Seiko is, is another one. It's a derivative of the Excalibur. The majority of the saws out there except for, I think it's the Hegner is the only one that I know it's different, is that uh, these, the notion of a linkage and no, vertical no. rockers, <laughs> vertical rocker in the back and the two uh, horizontal rockers in the front, 
uh, that's pretty much the same. And now then one of the one of the key things is to, to get this side cover off here. I have found that the secret is to stick a screwdriver in this corner here and just give it a little persuasion. And what you need to be careful of is this plate that you saw me refer to over there. You want to try to keep from taking that off with the side cover. It's not a not a critical thing if it if it doesn't stay in place. It's it's coming off regardless of what you do. No big deal if it does come off. You just take it off of there. And you put it back in place here. One of the things that you want to make sure that you don't lose, but we'll zoom in on this, is this wavy washer that goes over this uh, the shaft here. You want to make sure and capture that as soon as possible. Get that in your box of parts. Okay, now then to get the machine to hold back together again, usually what I'll do is I'll take a one of my quarter inch sockets that I'm not going to need, put that back in place so I can then, the last thing you want at this point is have the whole front half of the saw come disconnected from the back half. <laughs> it gets, gets awkward. Okay, um, at this point what you want to do is, because of the noises that were emanating from the saw, what you want to do is you want to pay real careful attention to the telltale signs that this thing is going to be giving you. One will be you want to look down in this area, this surface area down inside the saw, and find out if there's any loose parts in there. One of the, one of the popular ones that you'll find is this nut here, and you'll notice here that this one is loose. That's one of the sources of noise. Uh, the other one is this this one up here is loose, as is this one. Now you usually won't find all three of them at the same time. <laughs> as I said, I, I kind of cheated on this one to rig it up to give you the, uh, the maximum effect. Uh, the other thing that you'll notice is uh, on some saws that I get a hold of where the thing has started making noise and the, the owner of the machine just keeps running it in spite of the fact it's making noise. Uh, usually they have gone down to the DeWalt Center and said, what, you know, what is it going to take to make this thing right? And DeWalt tells them it's you know, 200 and some odd dollars to go through the saw. And oh, by the way, we'll, uh, it'll be about four months before we can get it back to you. Whereupon the, the guy goes into just shock. <laughs> and then they go back and plug the thing in and start using it some more. It's already making noise. How much worse can it get? It, it can get worse, yes. <laughs> um, what I have found with some of the ones where, where people have gone and done that is that this connecting rod right here, when that thing starts shifting back and forth inside of this rocker, what it's, what it's doing is it, it's taking a hardened steel bushing, a sleeve, uh, and I do mean hardened, it, it, it has gone through a considerable amount of case hardening, and that thing is sliding back and forth on that uh, piece of aluminum. Guess who's going to win? <laughs> the aluminum is going to lose, and when it does, it's going to wear a rut in there so hard that there's no amount of uh, tension that you can put on that bolt to cause that thing to pinch back together again and not move. And in that case, that that requires the uh, replacement of this vertical rocker, which is that's about a $35 part. Most of the, the bearings in here <coughs> are less than five dollars. The sleeves are about the same price. <coughs> um, Do you buy those through the DeWalt service center down the road? 
You can buy the sleeves, but you can't buy the bearings. The bearings I get from a company called VXB in, in uh, Southern California. They are just super responsive to me. Um, they ran well, doesn't have the bearings by what whatsoever? None. They, they, want you, they want you to buy the part, the parts that I was passing around here. They, they want you to buy that assembly that's got the sleeve and the bearing in it. Okay, uh, when I told you to pay careful attention to the content of the bottom of the machine, um, if there is dust, <coughs> black dust in particular, down in there, that is usually giving you an indication that something above it is wrong. So what you want to do is when you start disassembling that thing carefully, uh, be looking for you know, black dust emanating from whatever connection you have just taken loose. Because that, that will give you a strong hint as to which bearing has gone bad. Generally what I'll do when I, when I take one apart this far is I will go, th go through, disconnect, disassemble, uh, a lot of these things and I will go through and inspect the the sleeves carefully uh, clean all the grease off of them look at them and see if there are any indentations along the, the edges of the sleeve uh, the indentation that is on there will, will keep it from being smooth and it's usually an indication that the uh, the lubricant has failed but it's not to the point yet where it has converted the, the needle bearing into powder. The, the sleeve goes through the inside of the bearing. And what will wind up happening is that uh, as the lubrication fails, the, the, bearing, the inside of the bearing will cease to turn. So the sleeve will keep banging the same spot all the time. And that's what makes the dents and those dents that are on the inside of there are, you know, it, it's what I call photographing or, you know, indenting. But the bearings are pretty easy to get in and out. The, the easiest way to get them, get a new bearing in is you, you take the, uh, whatever assembly that you want to replace it in, you put a new bearing over the old one, you, you draw it down, the, the old bearing pops out the bottom and the new bearing is, is in place. So it's a done deal, and the next thing you do is lubricate it, and you're good to go on that bearing. Do you have the you, then you got then you got about 24, 25 more to go. Do you have the dimensions for those bearings? <laughs> um, I've got them on a on a sheet. Yeah, uh, it's on the it's on the website, and it's also uh, I've got a link to a PDF that describes the bearings and part numbers and all that kind of thing on, on each one of the videos that I did. Okay, I've given you the, uh, the clue there as to, you know, stuff to look for on the bottom. There's no, no debris in the bottom of here yet. So chances are these, these bearings are still good. So the next step would be now one of you is going to conclude before I uh, before I take the next step here. Is you know why am I why am I taking this thing apart and this this assembly out of the machine when all that's all that's going on is these loose loose screws here? Guess what? You can't get to the back side of that nut. You can't get a uh, torx fastener on the end of there in order to tighten that that nut on there. So you gotta you gotta pop this assembly out. And there's how I got uh, smarter about how to how to work on these machines. What I just did is I disconnected this uh, linkage from the uh, upper rocker 
going to do the same thing on the bottom one here. Disconnect that one. Yeah, that's what I thought I would do. Just in case. I have gone through this whole process with numerous times because these things plugged in, but I figured the YouTube audience would probably not appreciate it. Another precaution that I would recommend that you pay attention to is in this area here, on either side of this sleeve that's in here, is thrust washers. They are going to come loose. It's just a matter of time. I usually keep those in as I'm putting the, putting the machine together. I will put a dab of this heavy grease on the back side of that thrust washer, stick it to the side of the, the uh, rocker and it'll usually stay there until I get the screw through it. Okay, now that I've got both of these arms loose from here, used to be what I would do is I would take, uh, once I get this nut loose for the motor, I would take this linkage and this arm loose, but that drags wires along with it and just everything just starts getting floppy. <laughs> so I have figured out a smarter way to do it is disconnect these two things and drag this thing out from the rear. That is a trick that I learned from working on the Excalibur machines because that's the way you have to get this equivalent assembly out of an Excalibur is you have to take it out from the rear. And what I'm doing here is I'm capturing this counterweight that is on the end of the motor And you, you remember what I said about this screw on the end of the motor? It's left hand thread. So I gotta, I gotta make like I'm tightening it. Especially if you use that. Yeah. Now the, uh, the reason that was a little bit hard to take off was I had put it back together the last time using a lot tight. Okay. Now then all you need to do is coax this thing over to one direction for long enough that you can then drag this whole assembly out of the back end. Now you're ready to lay it down on the bench and start dealing with this hardware. Now, did, did, anybody, did anybody see this well enough to understand how to put it back together now? Uh, yes, I did. <laughs> okay. What's on the front of that? Nothing? Hmm? What's the piece of What's there? The okay. Yeah. Yeah, let's zoom in on that. All this is is a piece of stamped sheet metal. Where that thrust washer goes is right over this bearing right here. And then a sleeve will go through that. One on each side? Just one, one on each side, yes. So the, the idea is, and you've got to hold your mouth right in order to get this done, is you put the sleeve in there. The sleeve is actually wider than this part. Um, so then you've got to put some grease either on this surface or on the washer or both and put it down over that little piece of the sleeve that is sticking through. So that one will usually stay there. Flip it over, you drop the uh, thrust washer down on the other side of that one and then hopefully they will stay there until you get the thing put back together. <laughs> Okay, if Buzz will focus in on here, you'll notice how this how this assembly is, you know, flopping back and forth a lot there. As soon as they get this bolt tightened, and normally what you would do at your own shop is you would take this thing completely apart, take the bushing out, inspect it, 
put some grease in the roller bearing and if the if the bushing indicates no wear you know it's maybe shiny but there's no dents around it you could just put it back together and retighten this in all the saws that I've taken apart this is usually a stop bag because you've got the plastic insert on the on the inside of it um, on these arms here that is usually sufficient to keep that in place on this nut here for you know on this purpose here I have had those things come loose frequently enough that that's why I use Loctite so I I will always put one of these things back together anymore you know after having taken the Christmas machine apart twice <laughs> the thir third time is it, you know I'm, I'm smart enough to realize that uh, after twice you know I gotta I gotta learn them <laughs> Okay, I'm taking this nut the rest of the way off so that when I reassemble it, I make sure I'm going to reassemble this one with some Loctite on it. What color Loctite do you use? Use blue. 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 You can you can detach and loosen that thing up with conventional tools. If you accidentally get a hold of the red, you're probably going to have to have a torch and apply a fair amount of heat to the thing to get it to loosen up. Okay, the, the one piece of hardware <coughs> inside these machines that I have found that is not a uh, torch fastener is this bolt that goes through the connecting rod. It is a conventional Allen for you know, whatever reason they chose. Um, I mentioned in here that uh, all of these bearings, you can get them from VXB. You get the sleeves from DeWalt. The one sleeve that you can't get from DeWalt is the sleeve that goes through this connecting rod. For some reason or another, when they, when they did the parts, you know, spare parts, build on those things you, you can't get that you get the whole connecting rod instead but it's not a terribly pricey part so that's that's the direction you have to go the assembly you get from the wall does that come greased or does, does that come from china also? no it comes from china also so i i don't i don't take any chances with it you know perhaps there may be enough grease on it but my experience is there's enough grease on it to last a year. And unless you really like taking these things apart and putting them back together, it'd be a good idea while you got it in your hand, put some grease on it. Okay, now then the, the next step is, is to coax all of these all of these parts back into place. Yeah, there it goes. That believe this thing is going to let me down here on the easy assembly part. Okay, what I'm doing right here is I'm applying the louver plate to the to the end of that motor screw and putting this left hand threaded nut back on. So now that unlike that German guy where where he, where he did the good good and tight, you, you do this one tight enough. Yep, tight enough. <laughs> The, uh, the bellows is up inside of here, moved in buzz its way, but at the end of this tube, right right above this plate that is on the bottom here, the bellows is up inside there. Okay, now then, from do doing that bit that we have just done there,
usually what you could do at this point. Oh, I haven't, I haven't got these reattached yet. I was going to show you that they, they didn't move, and all of a sudden this thing moved a lot. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Okay, that process we just did there usually takes me a lot longer when I'm working by myself in my shop. But you'll notice now that when I move this this bottom rocker just ever so slightly, the top one moves also. So that's a good thing. That's that's what you're looking for. Okay, while we're at this point, uh, one of the things I'd like to point out here is that these blade clamps. And we'll take one of these things out of here and, and uh, there's a little blade anvil on the end of here, on the end of this clamp, that that thing actually turns. It rotates inside there. Now what I'd recommend you do if none of you at home have, uh, have dealt with this before, is you pull that little that little rascal out of there and then there's a there's a little o-ring inside there I would recommend putting just a, a tiny drop of mineral oil on there uh, other types of lubricants petroleum based lubricants <coughs> will destroy the the rubber o-ring that's why I say use mineral oil instead what that will allow it to do is once you get the thing reassembled, that anvil will still turn. While we're at the point of looking at the blade chuck, one of the things that I wanted to point out to you is that both pieces are shaped the same. One of them is mounted in this orientation, goes on, or on the bottom of the front rocker. The other one goes in this orientation and goes on the upper rocker that I'll show you in a moment. On both of these, the left side is where you would normally put a set screw that the blade rests against. So that is the stop for the left hand side of the blade. That set screw has an Allen socket on it and would be screwed into typically the left hand side of the blade chuck. And when I put these things in, normally what I prefer to do is put a dab of blue Loctite on the threads. The reason I say blue Loctite is that can be removed mechanically. It doesn't require heat like the red Loctite does. Once you put the Loctite on the threads first, screw the thing in place. What I look for is for the screw to stick through into the opening, into the blade path, by about a 32nd of an inch. Probably see that right there. What that then permits you to do is using your blade anvil, I refer to it as, it's a screw clamp. You screw that in place and you loosen that about three turns in order to slip a blade in, then you then you tighten it down. Most scrollers are familiar with doing that. But by having that uh, set screw protruding into there by a 32nd of an inch, both top and bottom, 
That way the blade will already be 90 degrees straight up and down and you shouldn't have to do extraordinary things in order to get the tilt of the table level. The trunnion on the table will detail against this detail that's down to the bottom here and that should by all rights be zero. The more you run that set screw out, the harder it is going to be trying to get that blade in there right. Yes, the, the set screw is actually going to get in the way of you threading yeah. the blade. If, if you get it any more than a 30 second. <laughs> now, what winds up happening, uh, get this thing down here before Buzz beats up on me here. This blade clamp here has a sleeve that goes in between here. It's going through those bearings. And when you tighten that screw down, what's happening is you're, you're bending this casting just enough that it's tightening up against those, those sleeves. That's all you can do. The only thing different between the two sides on this is you'll notice that relief in there to keep the uh, keep the nut from spinning. So it's a it's a half hex. The other side is smooth, so that you put the put the headed part of the screw on that side. Hey Bob, the other thing, two things that a lot of people have problems with is is the switch. Yeah. And, and the electronics on the switch, it's it's good to have an on-off switch on the floor, right? Or some, yes. some secondary switch. The pedal type switches are usually a whole lot more rugged than the than the switch up here. It's probably rated for forty or fifty thousand operations, and uh, I have I have had to replace that switch quite a few times. Well, we got a few minutes. Let me. Uh, let me talk to you about this motor. Some of you have uh, have probably seen or heard of one of these saws that uh, you know you'll be you'll be running along for some period of time. It'll get warm, you know, which doesn't take very long, and all of a sudden the the front rockers and the and the blade it, it'll start. You know, it'll run real fast, and then it'll go back to normal speed, and then it'll run real fast again, go back to normal speed. What that's what that's exhibiting is windings that are open, I think of that. That doesn't get any better on its own. It usually gets worse. Okay. That that motor there has one good winding left in it. What wound up happening is as it as you continue to try to run it. Uh, more and more windings would, would go bad and the speed controller board has no bearing on that. I, I tried to replace the board twice, you know, thinking that maybe I'd put a bad board in there, but it, it turned out it turned out to be the motor itself. I finally uh, came up with a contraption where I could take the, um, take the brushes out of the thing and put uh, contactors inside there and take and rotate the thing very slowly while looking at a ohmmeter and be able to tell when I transition you know, from one you know one set of contacts to the next. And like I said, there's maybe there's one good winding, maybe two left in there. One of the reasons I'm hanging on to the thing is uh, based on the expense of that motor being $265. Uh, I'm hoping to be able to find a uh, motor rebuilder locally it can rewind that thing for less than a new motor. I think of that uh, somebody that's used to working with a small motors should be able to do that. But I want to thank you, uh, Bob.